All right. So our topic today, um, timely, it's spring, allergies, rhinitis, and sinusitis. And you know, how, how can we get this cycle to end? And can we get the cycle to end? There we go, objectives. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what, what's an allergy, what is rhinitis, uh, what is sinusitis, what is rhino sinusitis, um, and then we'll talk about kind of acute and chronic uh, conditions associated with this, you know, what is it, why is it happening, and uh, what can I do? And uh, when we talk about allergy, uh, the Definition would be a damaging immune response to the body um, by a substance. So often we think of allergens as pollen, uh, dander or fur, particular foods, dust, mold, those sort of things. And uh, there's a few different uh, types of responses that we have. We have an immunoglobulin E response, and those are antibodies triggered by our white blood cells and uh, you know, we're talking a lot about immunoglobulins uh, these days when we're thinking about infections and vaccines. And uh, what these immunoglobulins do is uh, react to an allergy or an antigen. So an allergy, an infection, and it triggers an immune response. These uh, are type 1 hypersensitivity responses and lots of like different body responses that happen to these, you know, sneezing, itching, rash, runny noses, GI symptoms, all of those uh, sort of things. When we talk about rhinitis, we're talking really, uh, rhino is your nose. So inflammation of the mucous membranes of the nose uh, caused by a viral infection like the common cold or by an allergic reaction. And that can be common hay fever. Uh, Rhinitis can be infectious or allergic. Allergic rhinitis or nasal allergy is really uh, the most common allergic illness in the United States. Allergic rhinitis or nasal allergies increase your risk of asthma, the common cold, as well as sinusitis. We think of these as seasonal. So some people have um, birch allergies or hay fever, or grass allergies or there can be perennial, so dust, um, mites, molds, different things. So seasonal being like, I always have trouble in, this, in the uh, spring or the fall, maybe in the winter related to wood smoke um, and perennial being uh, year round. So common triggers, pollens, mold spores, animal dander, dust. We don't think about foods much, but foods as well, uh, air pollution. Those are all different triggers. And we talk about sinusitis, now we're talking about inflammation of the nasal sinuses. And uh, the uh, American Academy of uh, Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology has some really good uh, quick articles about different things. And that's where this uh, picture came from. You can definitely see in your nose, you know, we have our maxillary sinuses that we can see. We've got frontal sinuses, sinuses that are kind of up above uh, our nose and feel like they're behind our eye, our ethmoidal sinuses. So those are all different places where we can get inflammation. And for anyone who's had a sinus infection, you know, they complain of, you know, front head pain or, uh, you know, facial pain or eye pain, different things. So the reason being that inflammation uh, and maybe there's some blockage in these areas that it, it's, you know, we get pain related to where these sinuses are. These can be allergy mediated or infection mediated. And, uh, you know, and that's when we talk a little bit about, you know, an infectious sinusitis, it's always challenging, you know, when we um, will see people uh, have, oh, I get a sinus infection every fall, which triggers to me or every spring, it triggers to me that, wow, there's probably an allergy happening that ends up running its course. Now we have some blockage and then we end up with a blockage then develop an infection. And so, you know, a lot of times I'm thinking uh, upstream, if you will, is to like, well, wow, if it's happening every fall or every spring, you know, it makes me wonder what else is going on. So 
So when we talk about allergic versus infectious, when we uh, really common to have some sinus pain when you have a common cold, an acute sinus infection, you know, it's when we we get into more chronic things, if things are lasting a week, if you have fever and facial pain and fatigue and some of those things, that's when we start thinking, do we need to treat this with an antibiotic? Um, and, and, you know, there's pluses and minuses to all those things. And certainly if you do have a bacterial infection, we want to treat those um, with an appropriate antibiotic. But if we are not in that uh, bacterial sinusitis phase, then we start to think about uh, what other things can we be doing? And we'll talk about some of those things. When we talk about rhinosinusitis, think about that's the combination of the nasal stuff as well as the sinus inflammation. And so that's when these sinuses and some of our, these passages can get blocked, mucus can build up. Um, and those people that have a chronic allergic rhinitis or asthma, that can also be associated with chronic sinusitis. And we think about rhinosinusitis. Again, we're thinking about, is this an allergic process? Is it an infectious process? Is it acute or is it a chronic process? So these are all different things that we need to be thinking about when we're, when we're talking about all of these things. And, and you know, think about if um, an example of acute, and this might be more of a rhinitis, but um, when you go out and you're, you're raking leaves in the spring and you're kicking up dust and mold spores and all that stuff, like you'll end up with a lot of inflammation, you're blowing dirt out of your nose for three days. Um, you know, there's things we can do to mitigate that, um, you know, saline rinses, those kind of things to kind of clear that stuff back out. But those things, if they're led to accumulate, you say you have a, a polyp and now you create a really big response to this, um, you know, that's the people that end up more at risk of developing a chronic uh, sinus infection. So, leading into chronic rhinosinusitis. So common symptoms, post-nasal drip, coughs, headaches, facial pain, sore throat, fatigue, sleep disruption, brain fog, lots of things that people complain about when they have chronic nasal issues. Uh, causes again, allergy infection. And you know those infections can be bacterial, viral, fungal. And I think one thing that we often don't think about is fungal and mold relation. Uh, in terms of sinus, chronic sinus issues. And, and we know that those with chronic kind of nasal sinus symptoms, um, fungal infections then trigger a little bit more severe inflammatory response. So that makes that a bit more challenging. And, and if you're the person suffering from those things, um, it's frustrating, it's painful and uh, and there's things that we can do, but I think sometimes we're not looking at a big picture. We're looking for a quick solution. You know, interestingly, uh, people with vitamin D deficiency are more at risk of developing fungal sinusitis, uh, much less common colds and all of the other things which we uh, are hearing, you know, more and more about. Uh, in those with chronic issues, uh, people may develop uh, nasal polyps. You can develop polyps in your sinus as well. And so that can be uh, an issue for people as well. And that's uh, just another thing yet we need to uh, deal with if that's the case. There have been some studies that shown too that in those with polyps, there's often a food uh, allergy component as well. So the thing that often doesn't get uh, uh, looked at all the time is considering impacts of food allergy, which I just mentioned. Um, correlation of those food allergies with chronic uh, rhinosinusitis and polyps. We got to really think about pollen and food cross reactivity. Those folks that uh, have known birch allergies uh, are often very aware that there are issues with apple, celery, carrots, some stone fruits, hazelnuts, lots of different things. Uh, yeast and mold are obviously go hand in hand and those can be an issue. And so if you have mold issues, you know, cert certainly eating cheeses and drinking wine and fermented foods and, uh, you know, kombucha, kefir, those sort of things can all be problematic. Those folks with ragweed or gra grass uh, 
allergies, there's cross reactivity with citrus, bananas, watermelon, melon, tomatoes, latex. So lots of different things to think about. And I think uh, once people become aware, they realize like, wow, you know what? I can actually tolerate um, some citrus during the winter, uh, but during the summer when there's grasses growing or in the fall, if there's ragweed, uh, I can't tolerate that as well. And so I think that's pretty common for people to notice that during a season, if you have a food uh, reactivity uh, or an, an allergy, a hay fever, a seasonal allergy, that you have worse food reactivity during those times. So when we think about mechanisms of allergy, uh, you know, think about you, you, especially when we're talking about environmental, seasonal, pollens, those kind of things. When you breathe something in, you take in an allergy, it, some sort of allergen comes in, your B cells react, plasma cells react, those release those IgE antibodies, which the, the big kicker that we wanna know about is mast cells. Mast cells then react, go to the area. Mast cells destabilize, so they kind of uh, blow up, if you will, and they release uh, histamine and all those things that cause all of our crummy symptoms. And, uh, and then that's our allergic reaction. So you're sneezing, your watery eyes, maybe itchy skin, uh, coughing, all of those things, maybe even upset stomach or diarrhea can happen with that histamine release. So we'll talk a little bit about things that we can do in, uh, and you'll notice when we talk about and think about conventional medical approaches, we've really, really, really focused on the kind of that histamine component of it. And so, um, we wanna talk about how can we stop things a bit upstream, if you will. So in general, what, did, what do you do? You know, obviously if you have an allergen, if you can avoid it, that's wonderful. You know, and you, you know, I didn't look up, where could you live if you have a birch allergy and not have a problem? There's probably somewhere in the world you could live. But most of us live in places and there are allergens, so we can use air filters. Um, you know, avoiding having carpeting in the home, especially if you have pets. Uh, avoid if you have, uh, say you have a pet uh, dander issue, whether it's cats, dogs, uh, you know, keeping them out of the bedroom can make a big difference for people. So, so whatever we can do to avoid things. We can use nasal saline rinses, keep our nasal passages clear so that our little cilia work and they can do their job. We can work on healing our gut. There's a role for probiotics and gut healing always. Uh, some of you may have heard, we're talking more about early life exposures and this kind of goes along with uh, something called the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, those people that grow up with pets, grow up on farms, uh, kids that are playing in dirt. Now we know actually at four to six months to introduce peanuts in, in infants because it will reduce the risk of peanut allergy later. You know, and another huge thing is avoid antibacterial soap. Fortunately, fortunately uh, triclosan has been banned, but that was leading to a slew of more uh, allergens as well. So, you know, we want a clean environment and, uh, you know, washing our hands and all of those things, but also uh, there's probably uh, you could probably err on the side of too clean and too hygienic. And, and then, you know, you're going to be set up for more uh, allergic response and more adverse uh, immune reactions. So in terms of prophylaxis and prevention, you know, some things that we can do, which uh, really we talk about through uh, many things in supporting our health, ensure adequate vitamin D and zinc using a nasal saline uh, rinse, or there's a product called uh, Clear, it's X-L-E-A-R, and that is another thing. And it's uh, Clear has uh, basically water in it, some xylitol, some sodium chloride and grapefruit seed extract, and that can help up break down mucus. Probiotics are pretty interesting. So there's a few different uh, probiotics uh, such as lactobacillus paracaceae, uh, 
that's been shown to be helpful with grass pollen and dust mites, Lactobacillus salvarius, dust, Lactobacillus johnsii, perennial rhinitis, Lactobacillus acidophilus, dust and birch, Bifidobacterium uh, longum, Japanese cedar pollen, Bifidobacterium lactis, grass pollen and birch, and Megaspore biotic, which many of you are familiar with that I, I'm a fan of, really uh, has shown some evidence in reducing markers of leaky gut, which uh, I can say in practice has really helped some folks uh, with allergies as well, uh, just in working on some gut health. Certainly nasal steroids are, are utilized. Uh, I think some people still uh, occasionally get steroid shots when they have uh, severe allergies, but I think that there's things we can do to avoid that because that over many years in life would not be ideal. Uh, singular, uh, this blocks the activity of those uh, leukotrienes. You know, if we go back to thinking about those plasma cells and, uh, and then that mast cell, so singular kind of blocks that. That's a conventional uh, pharmaceutical. And then quercetin, which is a flavonoid uh, that I talk about uh, a fair bit, is a mast cell stabilizer as well. So it's going to prevent that release of histamine. So that works a bit upstream of uh, you know, our more conventional things. When, when I think about more conventional things, this is where um, certainly when I went through medical school, we really were trained in diagnosis and symptom management. And the number one thing is antihistamines. So we think about Benadryl, you can think about um, Zyrtec, Claritin, uh, Allegra, some of those other things that you see uh, on the, shelf at the grocery store or at the pharmacy, you know, those things, the histamine has already been released, but we're trying to control the symptoms, our sneezing, our runny nose, our cough, our uh, watery eyes, all of those things. Um, we can use steroids if somebody has a, a severe allergic reaction. We can use those leukotriene inhibitors like Singulair. Uh, we can use quercetin and other flavonoids uh, which will help in terms of symptom management, both the leukotriene inhibitor, uh, which the best example probably that people are most familiar with is Singular, that and quercetin will help stabilize that mast cell so that we're, we're trying to prevent the release of histamine. I, I like this analogy and I couldn't find the picture, but there's, there, there's the image of a, a janitor standing by the, uh, sink with the water running and the water's flowing out of the sink and the janitor's mopping. And, and that janitor mopping is us using antihistamines. Instead of turning the water off at the sink, then we can prevent the sink from overflowing. And that's where Singular and Quercetin would help. A couple other things that uh, people find really helpful and that there's some data to support is NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is an antioxidant. It's really important in our body. It supports glutathione. Uh, it supports our liver detox and it helps to break down mucus, like nasal mucus, mucus in our lungs. So NAC is uh, a pretty helpful, generally well-tolerated uh, supplement. Another thing that helps break down mucus is bromelain. And bromelain is an enzyme that is found in pineapple stems in that core. So if you have pineapple, if you have a uh, Vitamix or super high powered blender, you can actually break down uh, that core and it's full of bromelain. So, so that's a way to get it without a capsule. But uh, those are pretty common things that we can use uh, symptom wise. So in summary, uh, we talked about allergies, we talked about rhinitis, we talked about sinusitis, we talked about rhinosinusitis and some of the uh, acute versus chronic issues. Um, think about mechanisms of allergy, what can you do? And you know, I would also say thinking about foods as well and cross reactivities. So, and again, like just the importance of healing uh, our gut, you know, like, and, and just general immune support, which uh, is so important. And so 
some resources, uh, a lot of my information. Uh, it comes from the Institute for Functional Medicine. Uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology has some great uh, basic information on their website. Uh, a good book is The Allergy Solution by Leo Gallen. And, uh, and then there's a reference to an uh, article on uh, quercetin, inflammation, and immunity uh, in uh, PubMed. And that's what we got for today. So happy to uh, take any questions.